I'm Michelle. I'm here with my co-host Vaughn and this is Unpacking the Home podcast episode two. Today we're going to be talking about home as structure and I think that we have researched different types of structures of home, single family residence, condo, townhouse. I think we talked about RVs, trailer homes, stuff like that. So that's kind of where we're going with this. Yeah, when I when I was researching, like we kind of started this concept as home as structure, right? And you're like, okay, the literal structure of a home, what is that? And how does like what are they? And so like I pulled up just so many articles and so many different things that that go from like apartments and then like the 14 sub sub units of apartments and then single family Whoa. Um, single family homes, detached residential units. I went to tiny homes, town homes, prefab homes. I even like went into the historical realm of colonial homes because I was like, all right, so the different types of homes and there's like colonial and then that got into plantations and then that history Mm -hmm. and then also indigenous home as structures, like what kind of indigenous structures are available yeah, so that's kind of where I started um, going with it, and public housing too. I kind of got into that mm. a bit. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and then during this, you, I kept thinking about my own home growing up. The home that I grew up in was a single family, uh, single family detached unit. <laughs> you know, it was a single family yeah. detached home, and it was in kind of a residential neighborhood and track homes, um, early, like, 80s, 90s track homes, and that's where I grew up, and then I moved into a two-story single-family resident home, like, 15 minutes to the next town over when I was around 11, and then have always, nice. yeah, so then that, I started thinking about all the, all the different types of homes that I've lived in, too, as I started researching yeah. this, yeah. Yeah, I kind of, it's interesting. I took a little bit of a different route. I was I was thinking about like my preconceived notions because during the home buying process for me, I realized that I want a house. I don't want a condo and I don't want a townhouse. And there were a lot of feelings around that that I, like I'm not proud of. I'm a little bit like that. I shouldn't feel that way. But like, why do I? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So And even like, yeah, thinking about my homes as a kid, you know, I grew up, I think, you know, for the first five years of my life, we were in an apartment uh, across from some pretty big tech companies. So it was very expensive. Then we moved out to the Burbs and we got a little house there and it was real cute. Then my parents divorced and they moved into, you know, apartment, like rental, apartment, townhouse rentals. Um... And that's like the first time that I really felt like, ah, but all my, all my friends have houses though. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was kind of the first time that I kind of felt that rub of like, like we, like we didn't get the American dream. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that didn't work for us. Um, so yeah. And then, and then ever since then it's been different apartments and and condos then my mom got remarried they got a house real cute pretty cheap at the time sold it for a lot and then they have another house and then my dad is one of those people who one of those boomers that just couldn't afford to retire yeah because he was living you know in different rentals and different apartments and stuff like that so um he lives with me now so we're a multi-generational household so yeah it's there's just so many even throughout the course of one person's life, you can have so many different types of homes. Yeah. So, yeah, this is really, really interesting. Yeah, the first the first time I, I moved out of my – when I moved out of my parents' house, I moved into my aunt's house, which was a very similar two-story house with my aunt and my cousin. And then I lived there, and then it was another two-story house, same situation with family. And then um, – I think it wasn't until, oh, and then even in my first place in college when I lived in a studio, it was like a studio unit attached through the back of a garage to a main residential, like, detached house. So, like, mine was a studio apartment, but still in a a house, still in a detached house with, with a garage attached to it as mine. 
And then after that one, I moved into like a pre, what are they called? Like um, one of those trailer homes, but it's like, it's the prefabricated trailer home that's like on top of, you know, a solid base. So it's not like an actual trailer, but it's a mobile home, mobile home. That's the word. Right. It's like a, but yeah. it was, um, it was like a college town mobile home where it was on the street with like apartments and it was like a duplex mobile home. So there was like one side that was a two bedroom and then the other side was a two bedroom and then after that, I actually lived in a tent for six weeks to, to do a, like a road trip, but like got rid of everything basically that I owned, lived out of a car for six weeks and lived on the road in a tent at national parks and then moved to but was living in a tent in and technically for like two weeks until I could find an apartment. We were just, like, I showed, wow. I rolled up and I was like, all right, I'm going to live in a tent as home until I can find an right. actual home um yeah and so I was also exploring that a little bit like home like a because there's also the question that we pose are you a home owner if you own land and yeah what what I kind of came down to when I was talking about it with somebody else was like if I had a tent or if I had a yurt or if I had a like a something on on the piece of land that I own then I'm a homeowner even if it's a tent even if it's a teepee even if it's a yurt even if it's a prefabricated cabin that is still home ownership um yeah so I, I lived in a tent and then I moved into like a Victorian house um a Victorian house that was split up into four different units so I had like another unit like as a unit apartment in a Victorian big house that was like oh mm -hmm. here's this victorian era like lavishness of like all these like huge turrets that people like had as one single family unit home technically and now yeah. in this economy they're like okay we're gonna split this into four units for college students um, yeah so i had one of those and then i moved into another two-story thing that was split into a duplex one on top one on bottom and then another victorian house with lots of different people so there was like 11 different people living on that property at one time so it was like one huge four-story victorian house with a like a tiny home bus out front with a cabin in the back with the shack on the side and with like a room in the attic a room in the basement and like three of the victorian rooms left and i was in one of the victorian rooms um and then now I'm living in a in a duplex again. Uh, so this, I think, is from the 1940s or something, but it's another duplex where it's like an apartment kind of cut in half in a house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's been so many different... It's actually not... I haven't actually lived in so many different types of structures when it comes down to it. Like, when I think about it, I've lived in very similar styles um, yeah. for a long time. And to think that we're so young still, yeah. <laughs> we've lived in so many, yeah. And like, I think I, I well, speaking for myself, like had like a, a, a very privileged childhood. Like even though my parents were divorced, they were never in such a bad way where like I needed to go live with other family or stay with mm -hmm. other friends or anything. So like, even though we bounced around a decent amount, like it was still, there was still a sense of stability with it, which I think might not, it might not sound like it because, you know, we probably moved, gosh, 10 times by the time I was 25 or something, which sounds like, oh my gosh, what a terrible childhood, what a unstable home life, but it wasn't, so. Yeah, no, there can definitely be uh, people who have much larger historical trauma responses of movement from from yeah. like how oh, yeah. like moving placements essentially like but relatively speaking yeah I was in a in a fairly stable like where my parents were paying a mortgage there wasn't real fear of that like um constant transition so I I personally didn't grow up with that instability either um mm -hmm. In, in the home setting. Like, of course, there's different forms of instability that we're going to also talk about later in later episodes about, like, family yeah. dynamics in a home. Like, what does what do family dynamics in U.S. modern American homes look like? And so that's yeah. another area of unpacking. But as, as a structure, yeah. 
like I didn't live anywhere with floods or I mean the fires I grew up in Southern California so sometimes there would be fires but relatively speaking like I didn't grow up with war or famine or Mm -hmm. having to be displaced or anything like that like my home was very stable and structure yeah. um as a unit and I had chores and a little you know backyard that I had to do stuff in and a garage that my dad would work out in and the living room and the kitchen and the the, the master bedroom which we you uh was I talking about it no I was talking about it to somebody at work which the connotation of a master bedroom and yeah and, uh, and like that as actually being very much so tied to to enslave enslavement and like slavery times but yeah I had all of that I had the the stable home structure that was not falling apart there was no mold there was no like anything like that so yeah yeah and there and there and I'm gonna there there is status that comes with that like there is oh I don't think I realized it at the time because like at the time I my parents kind of that was their move up like the about six months before I was born they moved into this house into this new city they had moved away from like they moved away from like the big city that I lived in Mm -hmm. and I never I never processed or like clocked my privilege or status growing up with that like I had the the relative safety of the neighborhood the relative location between me and my elementary school um or the stability wise but looking back that was there and I did have I did have those things and I don't think the whole stability thing or the whole privilege thing I didn't understand it until about 2007 2008 with the financial crash with the market crash of 2008 when we had moved from my first house when I was 11 to that new town and like by the time that I was like a few years into that new town, um, it was all track home. So it was a city where they were like in progress, like they were in in growth in, in growth progress while we moved there. Right. So they put up, they like slapped up our track homes and we went in and we looked at the track home models and then they bought one and then we got into that one. And then at the same time, all these different areas were like throwing up different neighborhoods and like different track homes everywhere at the same time and like a new high school and like a new middle school to accommodate you know at the same time um or a new like shopping mall and I didn't realize the precariousness of the world in which I was living in until 2008 when everyone had moved in to all the track homes and then 2008 hit and then every single house had a had a for sale sign in front of it like I was not oh wow it was it was kind because it was such it was an in-between town that I moved to where it was like this the track home was selling the American dream for people and that's where the crash kind of came in is giving loans to people who couldn't sustain the loans or it was their their jobs and their precariousness was not actually adequately meeting previous standards for home ownership but they were like becoming more lenient and then just giving out as many loans as possible and so when that crash came it crashed in my town like it everyone was on that very thin line like and my parents were not on that thin line because both of them worked for the state so it was like Uh. I happened to have that security of having two people who were just in consistent government jobs versus so many people around me just having to leave all at once because everything just fell down around me so that was the first time that I saw like just that instability in in losing a home in in losing a home yeah 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 it's interesting I don't think I really clocked the stability and privilege of my upbringing until I started looking and not even for my current house, but just, you know, I moved to a couple different places after college or grad school and just like looking at different neighborhoods and different price points and like being like, oh, shit, I actually grew up in a nice area. Like I didn't I didn't even re- I was so insulated. I didn't even know that there were other areas that weren't nice like that. I thought that's just how it was everywhere. And during the housing crash, my mom and stepdad uh, we were, we lived in a rental house, so it was a single family house, but we were renting it. 
but she lost my mom lost her job but we didn't have to move yeah we didn't move until they bought a house in 2012 um so we were we were very very fortunate and i didn't even really notice it at the time i was in like seventh grade or something like i was so young so you're not i just wasn't it wasn't on my mind but yeah thinking back i it was just such an affluent area like i don't think any of our neighbors had to move nobody in our neighborhood lost their home none of my other family members lost their home so we, we were just i just didn't realize how how incredibly fortunate we were yeah um but now, like, when I was looking for this house, there are some parts of my city that you do not want to live in. And there's, and it's, and that's unfortunate because there's so many, like, socioeconomic and political factors that go into that. Um, and I think a lot of gentrification and, like, redlining and it's just stuff like that. Um, so it's really unfortunate. But if I had the means to live somewhere nicer that's where I wanted to be, you know? Um. <laughs> See, and that's, and this is like, so something that was kind of shot, like a little bit of a shock in my mind while I was doing this research, how I said that there's apartments. So apartments, there's like 14, like so many different types of apartments, right? And like, so the things that I, I found were studio, alcove studio, convertible studio, micro apartment, loft, having a, a duplex, triplex, a cooperative studio, garden apartment, high-rise, mid-rise, low-rise, railroad apartments, walk-up, condos, townhomes. And I was like, even, so in my mind, I'm like, home, at, home as structure is a single detached house because that's what I grew up with. That's my perception. That's the ideal that I have seen my parents paint as the ideal. But I was like, if I was a kid growing up in New York City, there's like, so many different types of apartments that are like yeah. the bouge, the bouge yeah. of what you want, you know? <laughs> and like, if you grow up other places, you're going to have an, a different concept of what is actually an idealized or an ideal place to live. And I mean, that's not shocking, right? Like we all know that yeah. if you have a ranch in Montana, you're, you're, you have the status and you have the wealth. If you have... I don't know if you have a ranch in Texas. Mm, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you have status and wealth. <laughs> oh boy! Um, to all our Texan listeners, we yeah. love you. Sorry, we love you, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> for for my, the most part. Yeah, for the most part. My parents just not moved, no. not wholly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> like I was backtracking on my like anti-Texas yeah. remark. My parents just bought a house. Um, they bought another house. So they bought a second home because they're getting ready for retirement. And this is like their phase in retirement home. Um, which I've also realized is when I was doing this research research of home as structure. Home as structure, yes, it's like for second home, it's a place to vacation. It's a play to, place to start a new chapter of a life. It's a n place to have like a different aspect of your life. But also home as asset like it's a it's an asset like it's a it's a generational wealth accumulating thing and so I've seen I've seen in the language recently like it it shifts from having you know the perfect white house picket fence American dream to to being like no whatever your asset is like whatever you can get most out of what your investment is like it's less so on how it looks or where it looks and more so what are you actually like financially going to be able to get from it so that was just a random thought um but yeah my parents just bought a home in texas i have to go visit soon i have family in texas i have a family with ranch and a ranch in texas actually too <laughs> like it's not it's not like Wyoming, Montana ranch, but they bought a piece of land and they have like three horses on it. And my my Ooh. aunt has a cow and she's very happy about it. So it's her ranch. <laughs> you know, it's her ranch house. Just one cow. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know if I've ever heard that before. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I'd love to talk about, we've alluded to this a couple times already, but I'd love to talk about the American dream. Cause I think that is so tied into 
even like like I started out saying like my own feelings about owning a condo or owning a townhouse or you know still renting I think that there's we've been sold this idea that no matter who you are no matter what circumstance you're born into the American dream is you can make it and what is making it I think it's you have access to education and you have access to ownership and you can own yourself you can own your own life you can own your own business you like nobody owns you basically I think that's a big facet of the American dream and even with the education like nobody owns your mind you're a free thinker um but I think inherent in these ideals is like the concepts of like independence and liberty and I think that for me not being able to buy a home was kind of a failure like I have like like I said earlier like I didn't make it I haven't I, or not didn't make it but haven't made it yet mm-hmm. um to that American ideal yeah. and like I wasn't thinking in these explicit terms but like now that I'm starting to unpack it I'm like why did I feel like buying a condo or buying a townhouse or continuing to rent why did I feel like those were inferior like something that that got into my mind somehow Mm -hmm. and I think it's because of these you know these ideas of of ownership and and independence like in a condo you own the unit but you don't own the building and you don't own the land so right there in my mind, subconsciously, it's like, well, that's already inferior than a single family residence where you do own the, the whole building because it's just a detached structure and you do own the land. So obviously, like in the American mindset, like that's number one, right? Like you, nobody, it's you. There's nobody over mm-hmm. you. Of course, we know that the American dream is not true it's not true (laughs) for so many reasons and I don't think that's a surprise to anybody um but like these things have been sold to us and like if we don't take a second and like go into therapy of your own mind and be like why the hell would I be embarrassed like like I was imagining buying a condo and like doing the Instagram post and like being like I bought this condo and in Like, I felt embarrassed about that, and I shouldn't have and still shouldn't, but there are these forces that are larger than me at play here. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Even when I was – so, in in the initial research for Homa Structure for this, like, the first thing that came to my mind was this book, um, Changes in the Land, and it's this book that kind of yeah. <laughs> examines the yep. the arrival of settler colonialists into America and talks about um, the concept of fences and property ownership. And so yeah. that hugely rooted in settler, settler colonialism, English understandings of, of owning the land taking ownership of it, demarcating your boundaries yeah. and saying, this is mine, this isn't my neighbor's, this isn't that neighbor's, this isn't the county's, this isn't the town's, this is mine, and I have this ownership. And so from the get-go, like you have settler colonialists coming in from the get-go being like, this is my dream to own my own plot, to own the, yeah. the soil beneath my land. And then it immediately came into conflict with, with existing indigenous understandings of not owning the land, of yeah. not putting up fences, of not using resources. Even when I was doing some um, research, it was from Novelli, Classic Commonwealth, Virginia Architecture from the Colonial Era to 1940. It goes, Virginia's virgin forests offered the early colonists a supply of timber more vast than they they had ever seen. So this is something that settler colonialists was like a huge deal also upon arriving because you're coming from England, which has very bare forests and wood is extremely expensive to import. So it's actually not, you're not using that much wood in architecture and home and like home structures coming from England, but then they come here using virgin forests is pro- problematic. However, yeah, like it was yeah. just a different 
stewardship of the land. So like the indigenous groups were using um, trees and different natural materials to build their structures. And so you just didn't see the remnants as much because they would just biologically degrade back into the ground rather than structures that we lean upon now, which will not just disintegrate back into the ground organically. So no. our home as structures have also become more toxic over time. But so you had English settler colonialists coming in directly in conflict of ownership, understanding of the land. But that was that was a driving force for for coming to the Americas is that land ownership part where there's there was not used land, which very false statement. However, now we know better. But yeah, very false. Like it was just a different understanding of who had stewardship of the land, who, how much you could take from resources, that you are more in balance with the resources of the land, rather than what Americans said all the colonialists did, is just come in and, like, demarcate. Yeah, it's so American. Like, I even have in my notes, like, as I was, like, thinking through this, like, it, it feels so colonialist. This idea of, like, I'm going to take that, and it's going to be mine, and then I'm going to defend it and keep, strangers and enemies and you know all that intruders out and i'll fight for it and it's i've claimed it as my own territory like it's 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 mine now so yeah that that definitely feels very white very white very white yeah Yeah. i I also think it's like you were saying it's super english settler colonialist to think that i as a human animal can claim ownership of of this little square of nature of the planet and not i need to be a good steward to the planet and it's not mine i just get to experience it here and live on it for now and then it'll continue and like and and it won't get passed down to my heirs and then they'll own it you know what i mean like it's just very it's 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 pretty arrogant which is kind of wrapped into the colonialist mindset anyways of just like I am this is mine now (laughs) like you know I'm absolutely absolutely it's just yeah it's questioning that feeling of like why would I feel ashamed of owning an apartment why would I feel ashamed of owning a, a, a condo why would I ashamed because it's like it is rooted in in that individualistic hyper independent need for total and complete ownership that might be where those feelings are rooted in of um wanting that independence wanting that liberty to be like this is my home I'm gonna paint it I'm gonna do this weird wacky thing in the front yard fuck you HOA you know like I don't know there's like (laughs) (laughs) yeah so there's that where but that is very white too like it's yes and so that's also because like how how different that is from indigenous understandings of stewarding a land having like long houses and teepees and log cabins and things that just don't that are movable that are like nomadic that are even things that are solid like they're still just borrowing they're still just exactly experiencing what this earth is able to give you when it can and how it can versus I'm going to make this into a financial asset and I'm going to use it and I'm going to pass it on through generational wealth and I'm going to protect it and I'm going to hoard it and I'm going to make it bigger and I'm going to make it better and I'm going to raise the property value and I'm going to sell it for profit and then I'm going to get something bigger and better. Like that is the American dream to me where even like Rick Grant in the Status Symbols American Value said, Most Americans started out with small tract homes and neighborhoods that were designed to hold their values that when it was time to trade up, these homeowners could pass their dream down to the next generation and move up. That is the essence. It's the essence is, I mean, unless you're a retiree who's who's building and buying your own perfectly designed dream home, that's the game you're stepping into with home ownership is you're trying to step into what will give me the best bang for my buck what will be able to benefit me long term? What will be a financial asset to me either to pass down to my descendants or to resale for a better for something bigger and better? It's very capitalist. Yeah. 
like that whole like economic aspect of it and I've fallen into it before like I've I've done the math where I'm like okay in 10 years I'm going to be making x salary my husband hopefully is also making x salary here's what the here's what mortgage loan we're going to qualify for let's see Ooh, could I sell my house for a hundred thousand more than I bought it for two hundred thousand Ooh, what kind of house could we buy then and it's like is this really the point of life? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what? Can't I just enjoy what I have currently yeah. and not just be, like, planning on how to turn it in the future? Like, that's, yeah. And and to bring it back around, you shouldn't feel shame, and nobody should feel shame with, yeah. with the condo and apartment because it's really based Absolutely. on on what your needs are um, totally. and what – what your needs are. So I know somebody who um, has a physical disability and they are talking about buying a condo because they don't want the land. They don't want yeah. the the maintenance around the building in which they don't really own, but they own within and they'll be responsible for that. But then they're also still building up financial assets. So it's really like, yeah, yeah what what is what can and what will work for you and your needs regardless of what our society says is the best or what we should be looking for. I mean, and it totally, and there's levels in that too, because you can even own an apartment. And I was, I started to read about luxury apartments and Mm. you know, you can buy a luxury apartment that has concierge services or concierge services. And like, it's putting your personal, you know, ability to relish at the forefront of your living experience and so there is yeah it is like what kind of structure do you want to house your life in and yeah and it also feeds into what kind of life you want too because I can't have an I can't have a dog here I can't have I don't want kids in you know an apartment uh that's too small for us you know and so like there's restrictions that come with all of these when deciding as like what what one wants to do with your life um absolutely yeah and I, and like it's funny because i would have i would have and i still say that those things but then when it came down to me buying all of these other feelings came up and i was like whoa where did that come from what is that um but no, I, I absolutely agree. Like even just yesterday, I got a fantastic letter from my HOA that says, you have seven weeds in your yard and you have 14 days to remove them or you're, you know, your second violation and you're going to get fined. And I'm like, okay, A, <laughs> that's bullshit. <laughs> I mean, yes, I do have some weeds, but they're so smart. How did they... I didn't even know they were there. A surveillance <laughs> you know what I state. Mean? Seriously, yeah. And, oh, the, oh, they had pictures as well. And I'm like, what? They were here? Um, so, but yeah, like if you are not in a physical ability to be able to take care of that, that's probably not a wise move for you. You know what I mean? Like don't do anything that you can't do, you know? Like take care of yourself, you know? Fuck the weeds, <laughs> you know? But uh but yeah, I, I I was I was thinking about that. You know, my mom has really bad rheumatoid arthritis. They have a big house, um, and and you know over the years it's taken a toll on her to yeah. try to keep it up, maintain it all, um, and do all the yard work and stuff. So yeah, there is absolutely no shame in a condo or a townhouse or even continuing to rent. There are a lot of reasons to continue to rent and to not even get into this whole ownership game yeah um there, there's pros and cons to everything but but yeah I think it's just it's all of those like identity markers of like the American dream adulthood like how is that defined and you know also just like naturally we're social creatures status is important to us keeping up with the Joneses like my friends are buying houses, my friends are getting married, you know, my friends are doing all these things and we're the same age and like, oh gosh, if I'm not doing those things, I'm behind or I'm failing in some way, you know. There's a whole podcast actually, um, it's called Race to 35 and these two brilliant and incredible women, they go on this journey to freeze their eggs because they're 35. 
Um, and they are single and, and kind of they grappled with those questions of like, am I a failure because I'm 35 and I'm not in a relationship? Like, is that, you know what I mean? So it's, but it's related to this homeownership aspect of am I a failure because of X, Y, Z? Yeah. Of course, no, <laughs> of course not. But it's easy to feel that way. And, and when you have a narrative, when you have a dominant, in, like entrenched national yes. narrative of home ownership as a status marker, which again, going back to col- like settler colonialists, but bringing it a little bit further into like uh, plantations and um, yeah. American slavery and having plantation ho- houses being the biggest mansion around you have like you have plantations that some of them if you count if you counted like the the quarters in which enslaved people were, were kept they have over a hundred structures on a piece of property and so that yeah. it also is like a marker of if you have the money the means and the labor to maintain yeah. that home to maintain whatever large thing that you you have ownership of is the marker of success and it's deeply yeah. tied to capitalism and, and and like the slavery part of capitalism where you had people who could just own a lot and own a, own people and own those people's yeah. labor and say okay I have this huge piece of property now I have these these people to maintain this property and it balance out the cost like it's also rooted in that like it's also rooted in like the ostentatious gross greed ability to be bigger to have more to maintain and to produce like and so that's also something that just to challenge like these concepts of huge mansions because anybody who has a huge house you have people doing labor to maintain that house yeah you have the ability you have the means you have the you have the monetary financial means to maintain your status. And that's why it was also a status marker um, because it's rooted in the ability to maintain that um, through probably not yourself, through probably not your own physical labor, unless you're like your mom where you have a larger house, which is what we're also experiencing in contemporary society when you have um, not a large community and you're not multi-generational living and you are getting older and you have your house still to take care of. And then, I mean, that's maybe why like senior living facilities, because we moved away from multi-generational housing, like senior living facilities are also homes as structures. You just have a lot yeah. of people living in one place who are being caretaked for, but the structure itself is not the people living there's responsibility either yeah yeah and senior living facilities i'm not super familiar with them but my grandma gosh i don't know how old she was she's passed now but she was probably in her early 70s when she was she had lived in a trailer home for i don't know 30 years um and then you know she just got too old and it just it wasn't gonna work um and so Long story short, she ended up getting into a really nice assisted living facility, which is very close to where we all were at the time, which was fantastic. Um, But the way that the money had to work was you can't have any money in the bank and then get Medicare or Medicaid or whatever the hell it even is. I don't I don't know what it is, but if you have money, the state's not going to pay for you or the government's not going to pay for you. So she didn't have a lot. But they had to they had to off it. They had to, you know, get rid of it. So, you know, buy a a new bed. They bought her a new bed, queen bed that was like electric. You pressed a button and it would like go up or down or whatever. I mean, it was like ridiculously expensive. She didn't need that, but she couldn't have any money in the bank because of this how how it all works. And it's like that's how that's the system for our elder care. Is if you're if you have even she wasn't rich by any means, by yeah. any stretch of the mind. But she just had, like, probably, honestly, like, probably $10,000 in the bank. Not even. But they they had to get rid of it for her to qualify for that stuff. And it's like, dude, what the hell? <laughs> That's insanity. Yeah. But, but yeah, so there's all these, there's just so many factors into any type of home structure. 
Yeah, I mean, that goes into public housing, too, of, like, public housing, yeah. relatively new program. Um, when did it start? Like, 1937, the, ha- the Housing Act of 1937, passed during the New Deal, um, was intended to, like, be a slums clearing effort, but you also needed to make less than a certain amount in order to be a part of the program right like you and yeah. it, it, that was a good thing like honestly during this time it was like you public housing is a good thing like even now public housing yes. should be a good thing yeah. they actually moved away from public housing to um voucher programs which i was like mm-hmm. i was trying to ex- examine like i was trying to think what are the benefits of that for the government like versus like having a maintained public housing unit structure like where the government is kind of like using that as public housing and in control of the structure versus here's a voucher for you to go into public um like section eight housing that is qualified so it's separate um like the government's Mm -hmm. no longer taking care of the physical like the physical bodied structure of housing and they're just being like okay here's this voucher it's more um individualized and I was trying to figure out what would be I mean it must be like more beneficial monetarily for the government to not maintain the physical housing structure versus here's this x amount of money to get into cheap housing who accepts these vouchers I'm not sure Hmm. but yeah public housing less so of a thing now but also of the same essence of like you have this very vulnerable class of people and then you say if you make above this level just by a little bit just by a fraction you're out yeah you know that actually happened to me one time on accident Mm -hmm. when i was searching for an apartment here Um, i moved to the current city that i live in a couple a little over two years ago from out of state and uh, my parents and i flew here and we were just like apartment hunting uh, because I got a new job and you know we don't know this city we're just like look we're just like googling apartments that are like close to where I work and we went to one and they said oh this is a um I don't think it was public housing but it was it was some sort of low income yeah type of situation and at the time I thought I was low income because I was making not great money and honestly I couldn't truly afford any of the other apartments here but i but i was too wealthy by their standards to qualify for the low income thing and i was like well where where do people who make what i make where do they go i ended up just overpaying for an apartment yeah um that i that i could not afford yeah um which is kind of what pushed me into this housing situation Mm -hmm. like and in my in my again i said on episode one like I could not have done it without my parents' financial help. Um, but I think that they saw that I was struggling with the apartment. And they were like, look, we'll help you get into a house that's basically the same price per month, yeah. which is ridiculous. Get a roommate, split it in half, and now you're living within your means. Yeah. And it's like, that's what it takes? Yeah. That's what it takes? Like, that's ridiculous. And now, like, now I'm in, I'm in a much better situation because I just got a promotion at work and stuff like that. But, but at the time, I was like, I am low income. Yeah. And they're like, but not low enough. Yeah. No, and I'm, I'm like, well, that's screwed up. I'm there. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm for sure there. We're like, I am in this weird between ground of being a renter and making just enough for this rent and for everything else. And then I'm like, I'm one of the most frugal people I know. Like I am one of, I am very frugal. I'm pretty strict on stuff. Um, Like I'm not too much. I do have pleasure for myself, but I'm on this line where like, I'm just above the poverty limit, but I'm also not poor enough to be like in a, in the position where I'm like, all right, if I could just be paying, if I could just be paying like. 500 bucks left less a month and then I would be able to like maybe have a house maybe go travel yeah. I'm like but I'm in this weird spot where I'm like in that perfect perfect middle ground of not quite able to afford to save up anything extra for like a real substantial down payment and also 
just making enough to like save up a couple hundred bucks for anything extra pleasure but it's like it's in this weird yeah yeah it's in a weird middle ground right now for sure yeah yeah and there aren't really programs or services or help for people in in that middle ground and and honestly i'm not very familiar with the programs and and help that's available for people who do qualify as low income maybe maybe those people are like yeah those programs exist but they're trash you know they don't actually help yeah which which i think is relatively true i think that honestly there's yeah. something to be said about uh i mean to to take it down to the most basic level of um people who are experiencing homeless, the shelters that are provided. There's a lot of shelters in the town that I'm currently living in, or not a lot, I'll take that back. There's like two shelters and both of them are very religious. So the the two options are very religious oriented, which is a trigger for a lot of people who are experiencing homelessness. Like that is an automatic trigger um, sometimes. And then you have the additional, okay, if, if you don't, if you're not like X, Y, or Z, or if you have these behaviors, then you're not welcome here. And they're usually rooted in like, I, I, yeah. So there's, there's a lot to be said about certain types, certain people who are experiencing homelessness and being like, no, I don't actually want to go to that shelter. And people are like, what, you just want to live on the streets? Like, no, I want to have a home. I want to, I want to live and have a home somewhere, but I also don't want to feel like I am a five-year-old being, told what to do inside of this home situation that is just another replicated traumatic experience of maybe something that has happened before which is you know what leads to experiencing homelessness in the first place sometimes it's also interesting like the term the uh shift in terminology from homeless to unhoused like i just went through like a work training a while back and they're like here are the things that you should terms that you should use and terms that yeah. maybe would be offensive so you should steer away from and I, I have noticed that shift from homeless to unhoused and uh I do think it's it's an important like change because you again you can ha- not have a house and still have a home yeah. like yeah and and like what really is the difference I, I like is someone who is living on the street are they going to be offended if you say they're homeless versus unhoused like i i don't know maybe but i'm I'm not sure if if that really makes a difference yeah and i'm not sure that the the shift in language is always about if people if the people who are receiving or being called that language i'm it's offensive rather shifting the connotative understanding of Mm. what somebody is experiencing or who they are like it's it's what is it called people first language so like you are putting the person who is experiencing homelessness first rather than being like it is this type of person it is a homeless person right where you're using their their distinction category of like they are homeless person rather than this is a person who is experiencing homelessness and so that i think is like trying to kind of shift the dehumanizing nature of it away yeah. from but it's funny how our humanizing nature is having a home like because that is right. a humanizing nature is having a home that is a part of being a human and if somebody doesn't have a home it i i know that it reflects on our society more so but it's also like if you call somebody a homeless person that is reflecting on their like d like it's a dehumanizing experience to not have yeah. a home but yeah, for my town, we there's also been that shift in um, the language of people experiencing homelessness, and and I've seen that shift also at like simultaneously bring forth a uh, new little like new little tiny home um, neighborhoods where you, it's like old places that there used to be like uh, homeless and camp encampments but then they've they've started like marking off sections and then building like a whole bunch of tiny homes around it and then having like communal showers to kind of address right the home need because that's that is literally what somebody experiencing homelessness needs is to have the ability to be in a structure to be in a literal 
structure where it's not on the street and it's not on it's not in a tent like yes a tent can be a home as we said like a tent if if that's where you're going home and if that's what you're calling home then yes that's a home and so also when they do in these larger cities when they do homeless sweeps and they go along the streets and they just raise everything and bring dumpsters and throw away the last pieces of what these people have have to call their own and they're just chucking stuff into the trash because you have people who are like this is my home up here and I don't like walking in and seeing their homes on here where they're not paying for homes and so you have that class distinction but it's literally about getting people into home homes as structures and we've we've adapt we're starting to adapt as a society to kind of address the issue of homelessness by saying okay well we might not be able to give them a single family standalone house we might not be able to provide an apartment which is trash because we should have public housing we should have stuff like that still we should have literal apartments where you say this is somebody who's really struggling in life with addiction, yeah. with dependency, with whatever, mental illness. Yeah. It's all, you know, it's all tied in. Here's this person who, for whatever reason, ever, they need help living in a way that is not dependent on their ability to show up at a job and to show up every day. They need a house, they need a structure, they need an apartment, they need a room, they need a place to lay their things and lay their head that is a structured place that is acceptable to society. So they've been building more like tiny homes and they don't have kitchens, they don't have bathrooms, they don't have their own private showers. Mm -hmm. Like, but that's kind of the negotiating ground that we're, we're seeing right now with home as structure of like, yes, they're not giving them tents, and being like, here's this piece of land and here it's tents for you to like live for the winter. It's okay, well, we have this like little wooden structure that has like a room and maybe like a little table for you. And that's what we're going to consider as like home for you, home as structure. Right. So there is that like adapting of, you know, versus a homeless shelter. Here's your bed and a room of 50 other people. Here's... Right. Um, you know, a tiny home that's yours for right now, as long as you need it until you can like get back on your feet. So changing the narrative there about what it, what it means to, to have somebody be homeless to an unhoused person to housing, Mm -hmm. to housing the person who's unhoused. Yeah. And I, I appreciate this movement and maybe this movement has been going on for a long time, but like this, this true, belief that home is a basic human right like there are certain basic human rights and being able to sleep inside of some sort of a shelter is one of them and as a society we have failed so many people and i do think that this movement towards like tiny homes and stuff like that it is trying to address our societal failures but if we don't kind of fix the root causes that that led to these issues in the first place, it's we're just putting band-aids on like a gaping open wound that's just bleeding out. And like we can throw as many band-aids as you want on that thing, but it's going to keep bleeding, yeah. you know. Did you know what? You know what just reminded me when you were just saying that is so in In, like, the 18th century, these plantation owners, right, they would have these massive properties. And initially, so there's no no archaeological evidence of, like, before the 18th century slavery because people would just keep them in sheds. People would just have these shanties. They would just put up these, like, haphazard structures. And there's no, like, there's no actual historical archaeological evidence, like, standing structure left over from, like, what enslaved people were housed in right and then so in in like mid 18th century onward like slave owners again in this novelli classic commonwealth virginia architecture from the colonial era to 1940 um said not until the late 18th century did it become obvious to planters that slaves were a valuable commodity and that it was in their owner's interest to house slaves more healthily 
provision of adequate housing also became a status symbol meant to demonstrate a slave owner's benevolence and generosity and to buttress arguments that slavery was not an evil institution. And so this kind of reminds me a little bit of like, we have unhoused people. We're saying, what is adequate what is adequate for this nation, for this country to take care of these people? Yeah, if we look back in 200 years, are there going to be archaeological evidence of tents? No. Are there going to be, right. you know, are there going to be little shanties that we find? Probably not, you know. And so what is the standard? Like, in our, are these tiny homes and are, you know, these philanthropic um, homeless shelters, are they just showing trying to say okay this country is benevolent this country is generous like rather than actually like liberating and actually being like here are adequate provisions here are adequate housing rather than just saying oh look we're getting better because we're we're getting a little bit better and I'm not complaining about that at all but just the the kind of side-by-side understanding of how we value unhoused people we really, like, they are literal people. Just like enslaved people were literal people. But the, the narrative, yeah. the narrative of what they need to do to earn humanity of living in a housing structure, that feels like there's some similarities based off of hierarchical understandings of humans here. Like, just because somebody is unhoused, just because they have mental illness, just because they have an addiction, just because they, you know are in a predicament that you don't find tasteful does not mean that they don't deserve adequate, substantial structural housing. Absolutely. And I do think a a lot of the stuff that you just mentioned, it, it does feel a little performative, honestly, because truth be told, we have a lot of money in this country. And if we wanted to fix this, we could fix it yes in like a month yes. or less like it, it like that it's it's not the money that's the issue and people say well who's gonna pay for it? you know what that's a bullshit argument and everybody knows it we just don't want we don't have the want to yeah um as a, as a collective yeah. and particularly in our leadership yeah um because i think a lot of regular folks like you and me were like yeah that's a that's a problem we should help these people we should yeah. help everybody you know but um but it is, yeah, it's it just, is about it, changing the hegemonic narrative that, yes. that is controlling our understanding. Because, you know, we, it, we'll, we'll start off, like, to end it, we started off the beginning of this with saying, like, examining where these shameful feelings around homes, housing, rooted in independence, rooted in early American ideals, rooted in, like, wanting to have these status symbols, Um but at the end of the day, yeah, it's about switching that narrative. It's about switching mm-hmm. the narrative to be like more collective, more not yes. ownership, less demarcating, yes. you know? And so like is that is that where it's heading more so? Kind of feels like it. Yeah, totally agree. And and to that point, especially with unhoused people, it's like we we point the finger we're like they did this to themselves and not the system is broken and it's pushing them down and keeping them down and there's no way for them to get back up um and yeah i think even with my own feelings like i like we started it's very like i me in individual independent am i successful or am i a failure did i make it did i not make it and it it it's we need to move away from that. Yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. Yeah, because we also, again, expand our understanding of what home can look like in structural form and how we can we can separate the home as structural form that we're living in as separate from our worthiness or our success or yes. our, like, you know, embodiment of liberty and independence and being a successful person again yeah yeah it needs to not be a reflection of your entire personhood yeah which it, it often feels like it often feels like it and I, I think I've said this before but like you know I've, there's some weird 
problems with my house and sometimes people come over and I feel like I have to apologize or explain it and be like that wasn't me don't think that this crappy thing here was me that did this um because it, it does it does feel like a reflection on you and it's it's not no and it shouldn't be no and you know if you find pride and pleasure in the things that you put into a home and your structure that's beautiful that's great yeah. fully agree with that but at the same time, yes, let's challenge the notion that the home in which we live is a direct reflection of our worth or our abilities or our tastes or, you know, there's, it's all right. It's all right. Wherever you live, however you live, we hope that you're safe and in a structure, however, whatever that structure looks like. Whatever it is. Yeah. We hope it works for you. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have anything else you want to add on before we before we sign off and start researching for episode three, home ownership and the self, which I think we already like we're just we're I feel like we started getting into that in the very last part, too. But yeah, so next week we're going to explore home ownership and the self. Like, what does it mean to own a home financially, socially? We kind of touched on that. What Mm -hmm. do we know about home ownership historically? How does home ownership affect our personal identity and social status? So we're just going to be kind of diving into it a little bit more next week. So a little deeper. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, a, a lot of these topics are so interconnected. Completely. Um, that, yeah, some of, some of these episodes might feel like they overlap, but um, they have to. Mm-hmm. There's no way to, to not. Yeah. So. And if any of this conversation inspired questions, please, again, feel free to comment. Send us an email at unpacking the home pod at gmail dot com. <laughs> and nice. and we nice. yeah, <laughs> and we will start looking at stuff and we would love feedback. And if you found anything interesting or had any questions, again, just please email us or let us know. Yeah, or or if you have things to kind of correct us on. Oh, Because, again, yes, we're not experts. Please, please. We're just kind of shooting the mm-hmm. shit, and uh, we, we're going to get things wrong sometimes. So, yeah, um, yeah, we're, we're open to that. We definitely look forward to seeing, hearing, being together on the yeah. next episode. And until next time. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.